Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am Dr. Claudia Albers, Planet X research and professional physicist. And today I'd like to bring to you another one of my articles. This one is entitled Planet X, Sun Simulators and the Distance to the Sun. Now our sun is dying due to the presence of a system of objects which have been absorbing its energy. In the form, we, that energy is in the form of photons or light for at least 170 years. And you may look at article 244 entitled The Planet X System, Destroyer of Star Systems for more details. The objects which have also been named stellar cores are moving around in the solar system and several are interacting with Earth. The objects also share their outer layers and thus create a lot of debris that has filled the solar system. This debris is in the form of dust and other clumps of rocky matter, but is very low in energy so that it absorbs energy whenever it interacts with matter that still contains a lot of energy. And Earth's matter still contains a lot of energy because the Earth is still generating energy in its core through fission of heavy nuclei. This debris is continuously entering our atmosphere, causing condensation and thus cloud formation around the matter and causing, therefore, the emission of light from the clouds that form. These clouds are therefore called luminescent clouds. And you may look at Article 303 entitled Stellar Cores and Their Debris Interacting with Earth. And here we see some of these stellar cores. This one is in the sun's corona, and uh, as you can see, it looks like a dark spherical object within the sun's corona. This one is most likely actually in the Earth's atmosphere because it was observed to be stationary in the Earth's sky. And they are often observed to remain stationary with respect to the surface of the sun within the sun's corona because they make a connection with the sun and thus rotate with it. This one seemed to be doing the same thing with Earth. So it was most likely actually within the atmosphere of Earth. Now, we also have these uh, luminescent clouds in the Earth's atmosphere, clouds that actually emit light, like this one is in several, in several different colors, orange, red, pink, and even dark blue or purple. Now, this cloud cannot be produced through any normal mechanism in the Earth's atmosphere, but for the entrance of stellar core debris, we would only have white and gray clouds on the Earth. But because stellar core matter is depleted in energy and therefore electrons, it absorbs electrons from Earth's matter which are much higher in energy. And therefore, these electrons, as they are absorbed, they let go of the energy. And most of that energy will most likely be absorbed directly for the matter, that, uh, the stellar core matter. But a lot of that energy is also given off by the cloud itself, by the cloud that has condensed around the matter. And it causes cloud formation as well because it causes water molecules that come into contact with it to lose energy. And when water loses energy, it condenses, well, water vapor condenses into liquid water. It forms droplets and therefore clouds. So you end up with clouds that are reabsorbing electrons, that are absorbing energy, and as the electrons move down in energy levels, they give off light. So you end up with luminescent clouds. And you may look at Article 275 entitled Planet X Debris Field Impacting Earth. Now, the powers that be have for years hidden the presence of the system and their effects on the Earth from the Earth's inhabitants through various artificial mechanisms and devices, such as the spreading of chemtrails in the upper atmosphere and the use of sun simulators and holographic projections. And you may look at Article 226b entitled Sun Simulating Devices, the Irrefutable 
evidence for more details. The artificial system produces an artificial sun inside the Earth's atmosphere. This is then a source of light within the atmosphere and thus the light emitted by the source is divergent. This has caused confusion for some people who think that this simulation of the sun is the real sun. The powers that be also seem to be interested in promoting this confusion. But this is not the real sun. And this article is an attempt to remedy some of that confusion. So here we see a device which is obviously not the sun, but yet it's bright, it's in the Earth's air. It can be seen in the Earth's sky, and most people would therefore associate with the sun. But if you look at it, you can see it's not the sun. It is, first of all, hexagonal. It has six sided. It has double or triple beams at each of these sides. So this cannot possibly be the sun. This is obviously an artificial device. And there are other devices with it that are obviously artificial, such as these uh, whole arrays uh, that seem to be metallic. And these are obviously um, artificial devices. And obviously uh, meant to uh, have some function within the system that simulates the sun and I have written as well about the fact that the moon is being simulated and if the moon is being simulated then most likely all the planets are being simulated in Earth's skies through holographic projections. And here we see um, an, um, a sun simulator, obviously, because we see um, light rays produced from this source of light in the Earth's atmosphere. We know it clearly is in the Earth's atmosphere because its light rays are divergent. And we know they are divergent because the beams of light that it creates uh, through some of its light going through holes in clouds are divergent. And if you extend the beams backwards, you can see that they intersect at a point which is not far above the cloud. This is where the source of light would be, just above the clouds. So this is not the real sun. This is one of the simulators. Now, the discovery of how far the real sun is from Earth started in the 16th century when the astronomer Tycho Brahe, who was also the last naked eye astronomer, made extremely accurate observations of the positions of the planets. He was a Danish nobleman and was able to invent and build instruments which he used to make his observations, which he also comprehensively detailed. In the last year of his life, he had an assistant by the name of Kepler, who was a mathematician. Kepler used Tycho Brahe's observations to come up with three laws, which came to be known as Kepler's laws of planetary motion, and which are still in use today. Kepler, Kepler came up with the second law first. After you observed from Bray's observations that the planets moved faster when they were closer to the sun and slower when they were further from the sun. So he described that effect in terms of this second law which states a line joining a planet and the sun sweeps equal areas during equal intervals of time. And here is uh, Johannes Kepler, it's a painting of him, and uh, who came up with Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. Then after that, Kepler deduced the first law whilst plotting the orbit of Mars. A circle did not fit the observations, and he initially thought that an ellipse was too simple an answer for anyone else to have missed, and so could not be correct. But he eventually found that an ellipse perfectly fitted the orbit of Mars, and so that he was able to plot it completely using an ellipse. So Kepler's first law states the orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the sun at one of the foci. And here we see an ellipse, we see the foci. Um, it has two axes of different lengths. The longer axis is called the major axis and the shorter axis is called the minor axis. The distance from the center of the ellipse 
to the edge of the ellipse along the major axis is called the semi-major axis. And this also corresponds to the average distance that a planet is from the Sun. And this is because although to fit the orbit of a planet exactly an ellipse has to be used, most of the planet's orbits do not differ from a circle by much. So the semi-major axis is a approximately the average distance between the planet and the Sun. Now you can draw an ellipse by um, tying um, a, a loose string to both foci using a tack or a nail and then straightening, uh, stretching this uh, string with a pencil and moving the pencil around the two nails or the two tacks and that will create an ellipse. The last law he came up with was about the relationship between a planet's semi-major axis and its period. And that law states uh, the square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. And Kepler came up with this law in 1618 and this law is extremely useful. With it, all the planet's distance from the Sun can, could be determined, and still can, um, if only one of those planets' distance from the Sun could be found. So, for example, if we simply set the distance between the Sun and the Earth to be 1 AU, even without actually knowing yet what that distance is, then the ratio between the orbital periods for Earth and Venus would tell us that Venus has an average orbital radius of 0.72 AU. And that is because Venus's distance from the Sun is 72% of Earth's distance from the Sun. So in terms of AU, it's 0.72 AU. And the ratio between orbital periods for Earth and Mars would tell us that Mars semi-major axis or average distance from the Sun is 1.5 AU. So 50% uh, further from the Sun than the Earth is. So only Kepler had, uh, so once Kepler had determined his third law, what we now needed is to be able to measure the distance between all one of the planets and the Sun and then we would be able to determine what 1 AU and therefore the distance between the Sun and the Earth is. Now in 1716 the English astronomer Edmund Halley proposed using a transit of Venus in front of the Sun as a way to determine the length of 1 AU. With two observers a large distance apart on the surface of the Earth, parallax could be used to determine the distance. Now parallax is the effect arising from observing an object from two different positions. It can be used to determine the distance between the Earth and a distant star when the star is observed from Earth at different times, usually six months apart so that the observations are as far apart as possible. This is all illustrated here. So if we observe a distant star in January and July, so when Earth is at approximately uh, opposite sides of the solar system, so the observations are done as far apart as possible, then the star is observed in different positions with respect to the distant stars. So in January, we would see it there, as shown here. That will be the January view. And from the July position, we would see it there. So it would be there. Now, from the angular distance between these two positions, the distance to the star can be determined, which is d here. Now, in the case of a Venus transit, two observers at two different positions on the Earth will see Venus in front of the Sun at different points. And the parallax angle is calculated from the distance between the two different paths Venus takes across the Sun for the two different observers. The parallax angle is calculated as a fraction of the Sun's angular width, which is 0.53 degrees, and uses the time each observer measures as the time it takes for 
for Venus to transit the Sun. From the different times it becomes possible to trace where in front of the Sun each observer observed Venus transiting and the angular distance between the two paths is then calculated. Once the parallax angle is known, it is easy to calculate the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So this is uh, the, where the two observers would be on the Earth. They should be as far apart as possible in order to make uh, this distance as far as possible in order to make it uh, easier to calculate. So one observer, the one at the bottom here, sees uh, Venus transiting along this path and the one at the top sees Venus transiting along that path. Before, because the paths are of different lengths, because it's at different points on the Sun, then there will be different times that they will both measure for that transiting time. And from these different times, it can be calculated where exactly on the Sun these paths were, and therefore what this distance is in terms of the Sun's angular width, which, as I said, is 0.53 degrees. And then once this is known, um, these two angles can be calculated, and from these angles uh, it can be determined. So here we have it again, these two angles. These two angles are not actually the parallax angle. The parallax angle is in terms of uh, observing the Sun from the Earth. So the parallax angle has to be divided by 0.72 which is uh, the 72% uh, distance difference between Venus's distance uh, from the Sun and Earth's distance from the Sun. So that this angle C is the parallax angle uh, divided by 0.72. Then from this angle, because these two angles are of course the same, we have two intersecting lines. So the distance then uh, between Earth and the Sun, which is here, is drawn as R. And then the distance between Venus and the Sun is 0.72R. And the distance between the Earth and Venus is 1 minus 0.72R. Um, so it's 0.28R. So then from this distance, from the distance that the two observers on Earth are, and that should be known, we have therefore this equation for this angle theta, which subtends the arc length d, and the radius then for that would be 0.2r. So we have d over 0.2r, and from that we can calculate what r is. It's d over 0.28 theta. And this is... Um, will work uh, just fine as long as it is, of course, in radians. And then we can calculate uh, the distance from between the Sun and the Earth. And this was actually done in 1769. And this was used to calculate the, uh, that distance. And it was 150 million kilometers, or 93 million miles. So, in conclusion, the distance between Earth and the Sun was calculated to be 93 million miles in 1769 using Kepler's third law, which he deduced in 1618 from observations done by Tycho Brahe of the motion of the planets. And the observation of a Venus transit by two observers at two different positions on the surface of the Earth. This places the Sun very far from the Earth. This means that only uh, that any source of light that may be perceived to be like the Sun but is within the Earth's atmosphere cannot be the Sun. A source of light within the Earth's atmosphere, or even from an orbital altitude, can only be an artificial light source or a Sun simulator. And here are the references. This is Dr. Claudia Albers, Planet X physicist. Thank you for watching.